Hey babe, and anybody else watching, and welcome back to A Life Together. Today, Mark 8 and 9. We're going through the life of Jesus, and we have been going back to back to back as far as content. Just so much stuff that the ministry and life of Jesus, it is incredibly dynamic. So yesterday, we were looking at Jesus in his hometown, a prophet without honor. We saw the uh, sending of the 12. We saw John the Baptist beheaded, the feeding of the 5,000, walking on water, true cleanliness. So not just the outside of the pot should be washed, but the inside as well. Uh, we saw faith and true faith in what that looks like. We saw healing. We're going to see more healing today, uh, but we're going to see the feeding of the 4,000 today, a separate occurrence. Uh, we see the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod, the healing of a blind man, and then a boy with an evil spirit as well. Jesus predicting his death, the transfiguration, a conversation about who is the greatest. And then also we will take a look Look at uh, who is for us, who is against us, and then we'll talk very, very briefly about causing others to sin. Really sobering stuff there, but we'll take a look at that. Again, Mark 8 and 9 today. So, chapter 8. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way, because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, But where is this remote place? Can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also, and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 men were present, and having sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanthua. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them got back into the boat, and crossed over to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, It is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fails to fail to see, and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand? How many basket pe basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the four thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, Do you still not understand? They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, Don't go into the village. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say that I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone, an if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him 
when he comes in his father's glory with the holy angels. Chapter 9. And he said to them, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led him up on a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, What did the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, with the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He, foam, foam, he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. O oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. I put, uh, how long shall I put up with you? Or, sorry, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my belief. My unbelief, excuse me. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. When they came to Capernaum, when, when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child he had and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Teacher, said John, We saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me, for whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth, anyone who gives a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. And if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, Cut it off. It is better for you to enter your life maimed with, than with two hands and go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than have two eyes and be thrown into hell, 
where the worm does not die and fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. I think that causing people to sin is really, really interesting. I mean, 41 now, and I look back and there are a couple times when I can remember, and I'm sure there are infinitely more times that I can't remember, where I'm sure I have caused others to sin. And I'm sure I'll do it again. But there's a big part of me that wishes I could go back in a couple relationships and a couple friendships and and treat those people differently and treat those situations differently where I wouldn't be tempting others to sin, where I wouldn't be in my own anger, in my own frustration, in my own misguidedness, causing other people to sin. I think about that and that saddens me. But also, I mean, that should motivate me as I as I move forward in my walk with Christ. Am I walking in humility? Because I absolutely should be. And it's so easy to forget that. It's so easy to have confidence, a misplaced confidence in myself and try and rely on myself instead of on God. And I know anytime I do that, that that situation, whatever it is, when I'm trying to handle it myself, if it's socially, if it's if it's anything that relates with other people, it's much more likely that I'm not going to be a great or perfect influence on them. Whereas when I let God be the center, then I'm rooted in something which, with a, a perfect foundation. But when I think about this, I'm thinking, good grief, my foundation in the past has been so much on myself that I know I've caused others to sin. And I think, again, that's something that needs to, that we need to be aware of for that humility in the future. Worth praying about, so let's do it. God, we thank you for your grace that is new every day. Lord, when we cause others to sin, we may not even realize it. Lord, please forgive us for all the times that we try and do it alone, or we have pride, or we do anything that would cause someone else to sin, Lord. Help us to recognize those instances that we may in the future walk in humility, walk as Jesus did, walk as the last, not to be the first God, but walk, walk to be the servant because that's what your son did. My God, again, we thank you for your grace and your love. And Lord, we thank you for your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, that is about all I have for you today. As always, know that I appreciate you. Wife, appreciate you tons. And I will plan on seeing you tomorrow. Have a good one.